So, good evening. Um, and thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. This is incredible. This never happens anywhere. Um, <laughs> so, it's, it's really a privilege uh, being here again. And I particularly thank the organizers for their remarkable trust in keeping you awake after dinner, um, which is usually an honor. Um, so, IGA Nephropathy and Hinoch Schönlein Porpora. Um, we'll, we'll start with an old guy. This is Prince Joseph of Austria. Um, and he was published, and I'm, I'm certain you know that journal, the Paleopathology Newsletters. Um, he was reburied some time ago, and they found his mummified body, of course, but his organs had been stored separately. And tell this to your pathologist if you want the perfect preservative that lasts for at least 150 years, take rosemary oil. And this guy had IgA nephropathy. So it was not invented by Jean Berger in the 1960s. He's the oldest documented case. So IgA nephropathy has always been around. He was, of course, not a happy prince because he also had gout, severe atherosclerosis, and putrid prostatitis. <laughs> So we're right in the middle of the topic. Um, this is our own biopsy registry uh, over the last 20 years or so, where you can clearly see that among the primary glomerular diseases that we diagnose by biopsy, IgA nephropathy is by far the most common, uh, followed by membranous in the elderly, minimal change, FSGS. We see very little MPGN, and that's notable. Um, and we see extremely little, little uh, C3 gen. This is notable because I had for a long time a renal sister center uh, via the ISN in Serbia. And whenever I came to Serbia and told them, look, I can give you a lecture. How about IgA nephropathy? You could see their mouth angles going down. They didn't want to hear about this. They wanted to know what to do with all their MPGN patients, masses of them. Now, you could, tell, uh, you, you could say that that's something specific to Serbia, but interestingly, the same observation has been made in Southern America, where in Peru, very poor, they have MPGN, masses of it. Argentina, it used to be rich, it's bankrupt now, um, IgA nephropathy. And a colleague from Romania proudly told me a few years ago, we're now becoming an IGA country, <laughs> implying that Romania is really doing well now. So there's an interesting segregation with socioeconomic standard, with viral infections, of course. I mean, a lot of MPGN will be viral, but there's an interesting segregation uh, in terms of where the disease goes. So let's start with the benign case. The benign case uh, <coughs> in Germany, it's, it's one of the only reasons why I'm unhappy that the mandatory army service has stopped. Because mandatory army service implied that every 18-year-old would receive a medical exam and they had to pee on a dipstick. And then it went wrong. They had blood in the urine. They went, were sent to the urologist. The urologist did a cystoscopy what is the likelihood of an 18-year-old having bladder carcinoma? And, and the guys were scared away for life. I mean, who wants to have a cystoscopy as, at the tender age of 18? But these were most likely IgA nephropathy patients uh, caught at a very, very early stage. The guys from Sweden have recently published this. Um, and they have taken IgA patients with a so-called benign presentation. In essence, just microhematuria, nothing else. GFR normal, no hypertension, no or, uh, little proteinuria. And they have followed them not for the 10 years that's in your textbooks. They've followed them for 20 to 25 years. And you can see that in a third of the patients, the disease disappeared. That's very notable. So there's spontaneous disappearance, at least in early stages. 50% had very little advance. 
20% made it to some renal impairment, 5% really went wrong. And unfortunately, as in other studies, it was not possible to identify them. So the key message is, whenever you get your hands on a patient like that, make sure you follow them for 10 years or more to identify those few who will really progress. There's a Chinese study where they even took biopsies uh, from these patients. So something like 90 patients, um, 30 years on average, all had isolated microhematuria and little to no proteinuria. This is what they found. They found crescents. In fact, 22 out of 90 patients had crescents. And you know what the normal nephrology response to a crescent is. Give them cyclophosphamide. Do something. And it's logical that these patients have crescents. If you think about it, IgA nephropathy is characterized by microhematuria. So there must be physical bleeding in some of the glomeruli. There must be physical holes in some of the GBMs. And if you've ever seen a parietal glomerular epithelial cell in, in Bauman's capsule and you expose them to blood, in particular fibrin, they grow like mad. So it's logical that you can detect crescents. And the therapy, of course, should not be poison that patient with cyclophosphamide. The therapy should be lower their glomerular blood pressure so that the hole can heal. And that leads me to the discussion of glomerular crescents, uh, which I think is a very dangerous one. If you look at IgA nephropathy biopsies, this is a 3,000 uh, patient uh, cohort uh, compiled from all over the world. And you can see that many, many, many patients will have crescents. But you can also see that it's very unusual to have more than 40% even more than 25% is very, very unusual. So one crescent in IgA nephropathy doesn't herald a nightmare. Here's a patient I saw some months ago. Uh, he's a young Greek guy, normal GFR, 0.7 grams per day of proteinuria. You would say this is a low-risk situation. Unfortunately, his doctor in Athens noted that there was one crescent uh, in the biopsy. He was given meth methylprednisolone pulse therapy and MMF. This is what the guy looks like. He was actually shy to undress in front of me. And this guy is disfigured for life for no reason, for absolutely no reason. I've stopped him to stop all immunosuppressive medication and just take his ACE inhibitor, which he hadn't been given, by the way. This is not to say there's not a vasculitic IgA variant. There is a, a malignant type of IgA nephropathy. This is the other extreme. These patients have, and you can read it there, 66% of crescents. This is totally different from the one crescent in 14 glomeruli. But you can tell if in Beijing they are only able to find 110 patients in Beijing it's rare. <laughs> this must be rare. And these people have a terrible prognosis. Within 100 months, 80% of them have lost renal function. And we have no idea what to do to them. The guidelines still tell you, treat them like anchor vasculitis. We do it because we know no better. Uh, and I'm not certain. We're just starting the revision of the guidelines um, I'm not certain we will be able to revise that recommendation because we know no better. We have no idea what to do. So, oops, I'm really sorry. You, you can tell I'm using a slightly outdated slide here. Um, <laughs> I, I do know the, near, the, the year. Um, so I've, I've covered the two extremes. Uh, we've covered the no problem situation with minor urinary findings, GFR normal, BP normal, if you see a crescent lower blood pressure, unless you see 60% of crescents. So one crescent doesn't mean immunosuppression. And the challenge here is 
to keep these people under your control for at least 10 years. So you tell them, come back, see me in two years. They come back, see you. You tell them, oh, everything's fine, go home, come back in two years. They come back another two years later. You tell them, everything's fine, come back, see me. Only teachers make it three times. All the others you lose. So the challenge is to have a reminder system and make these people aware, hey, you need to have your kidney function checked in 10 years from now, in 20 years. The other extreme is the attention situation, where you rapidly lose GFR. And this is the value of the crescent. Crescentic IgA nephropathy should not be interpreted as an immediate call for action, as I told you. You have to take the clinical picture and the clinical cause into account. It has to be an RPGN cause with rapidly progressive loss of renal function, not rapidly develop, developing crescents. And this could be due to many situations, of course. It could be simply AKI from macrohematuria. I've seen several IgA patients who had, every time they had an infection, their creatinine shot up and then it got down again often not really to the point where they started, so they really lost a little. But this is, uh, is a situation where you only need supportive therapy. And it could be nephrotic syndrome, and I'm stressing syndrome here, because it's fairly, at least in Caucasians, it's fairly unusual to have nephrotic syndrome in IgA nephropathy. You can have nephrotic range proteinuria, in particular if your blood pressure is badly controlled, but true nephrotic syndrome is very unusual. Go ask your pathologist, did you do EM? Did you rule out that this is minimal change nephropathy with coincidental IgA deposits? Or, as I told you, it could be the rare case of RPGN, in which case the guidelines tell you use immunosuppression. So we are right in the middle of pathogenesis. So from what I told you, if... 30% of early IgA patients can go into spontaneous remission and only a minor fraction will really lose renal function uh, over 20 years. It's very clear that there must be potent modifiers. This could be generic hypertension. I mean, amongst us, every second will develop hypertension. I have hypertension. I don't look like it. I have it. Thank you, Mom. Um, <laughs> It could be obesity, it could be something else. Um, so the other thing is genetic factors. There's now a worldwide risk model for IgA nephropathy and it's clear that there's a hotspot in Southeast Asia. Um, and there are protective genes and non-protective genes and, and they clearly cluster in Southeast Asia. Uh, you can tell the UK, Scotland is bad. Uh, stay down here. Um, but if you ever come across an African patient with IgA nephropathy, tell me, you have something rare in your hands. The prognosis, this is still the traditional old thing. Um, the French looked at this, and, and this is a notable cohort because it's from the 90s when uh, ACE inhibitors were already on the market. Captopril was licensed in 85. And they simply said, we'll, give, we'll use a, a really simple risk score composed of hypertension, one point, proteinuria above a gram, you get a point, pathology score high, you get a point. And here's the big surprise, the higher your score, the worse your prognosis. The latest one uh, in terms of prognostic factors is hematuria. But you can see that the influence of hematuria, whether it's persistent or minimal or absent, is lowish. And you really need to follow patients for a prolonged time. Um, and you have to do a systematic recording of hematuria. So right now, there's uncertainty how much you can base on a single examination in terms of hematuria in your patients. Certainly, if your patient has hematuria, the prognosis may be somewhat worse than in the rare patient who has IgA nephropathy and who doesn't have hematuria. 
So step number one in the pathogenesis, as we understand it today, is the increased occurrence of IgA1 with poor galactosylation in the circulation. Now you digest that after dinner. And this is a fixed defect. Uh, you can take B cells, immortalize them from patients with IgA nephropathy, and they will secrete this poorly galactosylated IgA, as discovered in this funny lectin assay. Uh, you may have even eaten helix aspersa. They're usually used in French recipes, but you can also isolate this funny lectin from them uh, that will recognize a poorly galactosylated IgA. Unfortunately, it's not easy to standardize the snails. Um, so the lectin assay was kind of tricky, and I'll come to back to that in a minute. And the notable thing is that if you immortalize these B cells from IgA patients, they do secrete primarily dimeric or even trimeric IgA, which is exactly what we know is deposited in the glomeruli. It's not monomeric. You and I have 90, 90 uh, 90 plus percent of our normal IgA in serum is monomeric. That is not deposited. And they also noted that these B cells have a fixed defect in their enzymes that, that glycosylates the IgA, and in particular this so-called hinge region, the violet region here of the IgA molecule, where there's an overactivity of 2,6-silyl transferase and a decreased activity of beta-1,3 galactosyl transferase. And that results in this typical undergalactosylation of the IgA molecule. Thanks to John Feely and the people in Leicester, we know that this is really the IgA that's deposited. <laughs> they managed to get their hands on three complete kidneys from IgA patients in the course of trauma, malignancy, whatever. And they noted that in this lectin assay, well, in serum, uh, the IgA signal wasn't really that different from the normals. But when they elevated the IgA of the glomeruli, this is where they really found the undergalactosylated IgA. So the take-home message here is that it's mostly dimeric and polymeric IgA, large one, and it's undergalactosylated, and that seems to be what is starting the disease as we understand it today. Now, what I consider a, a major advance in diagnostics uh, has just been published or is just about to be published. Hitoshi Suzuki from Tokyo developed a monoclonal antibody against undergalactosylated IgA, which is specific, and here's what he found. This antibody recognizes all the IgA deposits, just like a pan-IgA antibody, and there's perfect overlay. Here's a case of lupus. You have a lot of IgA, the classical full house pattern, but here is KM55, totally absent. So in lupus, IgA is deposited in the glomerulus, but it has nothing to do with the IgA that you find in IgA nephropathy. And the most interesting thing in that study was that, for example, in liver cirrhosis, the condition that we call IgA nephropathy has nothing to do with IgA nephropathy because it's negative with this antibody. So in liver cirrhosis, you have a failure to excrete IgA through the gall, and it has little or nothing to do with IgA nephropathy. Now, the fact that galactosylation or glycosylation of proteins can induce renal disease is known from animals. Here's a mouse deficient in beta-1,4 galactosyl transferase, and these mice do develop mesangial expansion. They have some hematuria and some proteinuria. Now, the few of you who are really awake and smart at this time of the day will have noted the minor difference here in terms of comparing this with the human data I just showed you. In humans, the defect is beta-1,3 galactosyl transferase. Here's beta-1,4, which we don't have or which does something else in you and me. 
So mice are largely useless to study the early events in IgA nephropathy. And this is what's really, really hampering the field. The preclinical studies are missing because there's no valid rodent model of IgA nephropathy. Mice don't have two IgAs. They have a totally different elimination of the IgA. They have no hinge region in the IgA. They're totally different. So one day, the German primate center called me and they told me, we have these monkeys, marmoset monkeys. And we keep them in captivity, primate centers like these. Uh, they are monkeys about this size, and then you have a tail like that size. Um, but they're easily to br breed. They live in small colonies, and they die. They die in captivity from renal failure. And when you take out their kidneys, it looks like IgA nephropathy. Interestingly, the same observation has been made in the London Zoo, so it's not the German primate center, and it, the same has been made in Melbourne. So it has something to do with diet, and this is an interesting observation in itself. Diet seems to kill these monkeys. They normally live in the jungles of Brazil, and I had more than one volunteer fellows who volunteered to go to the jungles in Brazil and study them, except that the Brazilian government, we had serious discussions about this, uh, the, the Brazilian government doesn't allow export of animal tissue, except meat, but certainly not monkey kidneys. So we don't know <laughs> whether these guys die from IgA nephropathy. And we, but we thought, yes, we have the spontaneous IgA model, we're doing a good thing, we're curing monkeys now. And then we analyzed their IgA molecule and they have no hinge region. They cannot be undergalactosylated. They have no hinge region. You would have to do studies in chimpanzees to study human IgA nephropathy. And this is the major, major challenge in IgA nephropathy. So if you look at the pathogenesis that we discussed so far, we know that there's something wrong in the bone marrow. Again, thanks to studies done in Leicester. And that the bone marrow has B cells producing poorly galactosylated IgA. And this deposits in the kidney, and this is what starts IgA nephropathy. This would be a case of the wrong IgA in serum. And there are indeed companies trying to eliminate the undergalactosylated IgA from the circulation, which I view as a fruitless attempt. You would have to do this for 20 years or more. How on earth can you do that against the background of masses of regular IgA? But there's a very interesting alternative hypothesis. Same sequence of events, but there's one step before. Mucosal B cells, which in you and me produce undergalactosylated IgA. This is our, your and mine, normal intestinal IgA. They get the wrong signal. Go to the bone marrow and produce your mucosa type IgA in the bone marrow. So the fundamental implication, and I guess you will see this, is that now you have a case where you have the right IgA, namely mucosa type IgA, made in the wrong place. And the implication is that you no longer have to ask yourself, how can I eliminate this IgA, but rather, how can I tell this lymphocyte to please stay in the mucosa and don't migrate to the bone marrow? And again, that in a way has been tested recently. They first tested this in Sweden, studies you can only do in Sweden. People in Sweden were given enemas and they had to hold it for an hour. <laughs> Fifteen hours later, they got a rectal sonde. And the rectal sonde was measuring nitric oxide and myeloperoxidase, just as evidence of ongoing inflammation. And they were very frustrated with the results. Now they had done all these enemas, and, and they found <laughs> just three patients really responded. And another few responded with myeloperoxidase. But overall, 8 out of 27 patients had some evidence of gluten sensitivity. 
Now you will tell me that's trivial. I've learned in med school that celiac disease can be associated with IgA nephropathy. True. But a study you can only do in Sweden. They were given more enemas. And they were now given of albumin. They were given soy protein. And the result was always the same. A third of the patient responded. So this is not subclinical celiac disease. This is general hypersensitivity against food antigens. There's something wrong in the intestine. They respond to food. And you can easily also see why there will probably no, not never be an IgA diet. If you respond to gluten, to soy protein, and to ovalbumin, you can maybe eat newspaper. <laughs> so you have a problem there. But this laid the basis for this study, um, a phase 2b trial that we have just concluded <coughs> using targeted release budesonide. You all know budesonide, an intestinal steroid with a very high first pass effect in the liver. So you have a little systemic action, but it's really little. And this was a phase two where the initial primary endpoint was just proteinuria. Proteinuria was reduced by this budesonide, but very surprisingly in the phase two trial, in a small group of patients, the placebo group continuously lost renal function and this was completely stabilized with that targeted release budesonide. Targeted release meaning that the budesonide was encapsulated so that it's released right here in the terminal ileum where you have the highest density of pious plugs. So maybe, and this is a terrible thought, maybe one day IgA nephropathy is a GI disease. That will be tough. So a phase three trial is just ongoing. Uh, it's actually just starting. Now if you ask me, can I do the same thing with regular old budesonide? I have no idea. I don't know. So let's come back to step one in the pathogenesis. You have this increased occurrence of IgA with poor galactosylation in the <coughs> circulation. Obviously, it will be really hard to eliminate causal infections and antigens. If you respond to every food possible, it will be hard. But maybe you can dampen the response <coughs> using a steroid that largely is restricted to the mucosa. Maybe. Step number two. There is evidence that you generate IgG autoantibodies against poorly galactosylated IgA. That would make IgA nephropathy an autoimmune disease. And indeed, we know that the more antibody you have, the worse is your renal risk. So it does segregate with outcome. And this, of course, would call for immunosuppression. But hopefully I can convince you why I have major doubts that IgA nephropathy is a classical autoimmune disease. Because it responds so differently than membranous, than lupus, than all the traditional autoimmune diseases. This is where how the evidence goes. Here's a trial on ACE inhibitors and steroids versus ACE inhibitors alone. It was done in, the, uh, in 2009 in southern Italy. Patients were given Ramipril 2.5 milligrams per day. 2.5, that's homeopathy. Uh, it was uptitrated by 1.25 milligrams or they were given that plus oral prednisone. But look at the dosage, one milligram per kilo per day for two months. We're talking real steroid here, not just a little bit. The outcome was dramatic. <coughs> the Ramipril group lost 6 mils of GFR in a year. That group lost 0.5. Now the tricky thing here was the design. The design required all the patients who were on ACE inhibitors to stop them before the trial started. Now you and I know what happens if you have an IgA patient on an ACE inhibitor and you stop the ACE inhibitor. 
proteinuria will shoot up. This is nice because you can now include that patient in your trial. But it's certainly not what you would do normally. And the concern here is that a lot of low-risk patients were included in that trial who were well controlled on an ACE inhibitor alone. So in parallel, we had started this trial, the STOP IGA trial, where we had asked, and I, I believe this is what you and I would agree on, why not do everything you can in terms of supportive care first and then decide to start immunosuppression? So we took patients with IgA nephropathy with a GFR above 30, proteinuria we had arbitrarily set at 0.75 grams per day because we were concerned we couldn't recruit enough. We over-recruited, so it was not a problem in retrospect. But then we had a six-month run-in phase, and those who lowered their proteinuria below 0.75 grams per day, they were dropped out of the trial. They were also dropped out uh, if the proteinuria was in the nephrotic range despite everything we did. So that's a concern. This was 3% of the patients fell into that group, and 3% of the patients fell into the group with a pronounced GFR loss in the run-in phase. By simply optimizing supportive care, their GFR dropped massively. So there was something fishy with them. But the, about half of the patients, or something like 40% of the patients, were non-responders, defined as still having a proteinuria above 0.75 grams per day, and these were then randomized to continue on supportive or to receive immunosuppression in addition. For those of you who like to doze off now, this is the only slide I want you to remember. This is a slide that I go over with all my patients and I tell them what to do. And this will apply to essentially any glomerular disease. So I tell them to control blood pressure to a sitting BP in the 120s. I tell them to uptitrate their RAS blocker even if blood pressure target has been achieved, but if there's still high-grade proteinuria, why not uptitrate it further? Few patients will become orthostatic. I tell them to avoid dihydropyridine-type uh, calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, at least first line, because amlodipine will cause vasodilation in the vas afferens of the glomerulus, so you transmit the blood pressure into the glomerulus. I tell them to control protein intake, to restrict salt intake, to restrict and don't push fluids. For, this. for most patients, that's an aha. My doctor always told me I should push fluids. It's nonsense. And I tell them to control all components of the metabolic syndrome. That's bad news. It essentially says lose weight. And you have to talk to your patients, and this again, was an extremely important insight for me. You have to talk to patients on what type of exercise they should do. You know, normally you have a man sitting in front of you and you tell them, uh, you need to exercise. They either say, yes, yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. I do it sometime. But you have some men taking you seriously. And they buy a sus subscription to the next fitness studio right away and they do all the sports of the last year in one weekend. They come back Monday with raptomyelitis. <laughs> but the guy who really told me something was a fire brigade worker. Uh, at the age of 60, he came to us with a creatinine of three and we couldn't figure out what he has. So we took a renal biopsy. We found hypertensive renal damage, isolated hypertensive renal damage. But because he had been in the fire brigade for 30 years, he had a twice annual checkup and he was documented hypotensive for the last 30 years. We found hypertensive kidney injury. And then we quizzed him and he had been pushing weights for the last 30 years. Blood pressure has been measured online in professional weightlifters and they can have peaks up to 350. So by simply pushing weights and having these extremely strenuous exercises, you can apparently damage your kidneys. 
And you have to tell your patient what is a good sport and what is a bad sport. Soccer, for example, I shouldn't say that as a German, soccer is bad <laughs> because it's a high intensity sport if you do it the German way. <laughs> okay? You should do something that's continuous, like jogging, running, swimming, you know what I mean. Um, if all that doesn't work, give them 25 milligrams of spironolactone. It sometimes does miracles in lowering proteinuria. Tell them to stop smoking. If you have IgA nephropathy and you smoke, your risk of ending up on dialysis is tenfold higher. Tenfold. Every time you smoke, your blood pressure increases. So after I've gone over this list with my patients, they're usually totally depressed. No steak anymore, lose weight, do exercise, stop smoking. Life has come to an end. And then I pull my wonder weapon, a Finnish study, alcohol. The Finns know something about this. They took 158 IgA patients and they grouped them as abstinent. They had real problems with that group. Um, <laughs> low, moderate or high intake. And the good news is women can drink a little and my fellows, we can drink more. <laughs> and patients love you. They will do what you want because they can continue drinking at least. <laughs> and you have gotten rid of the myth that you can't have an ACE inhibitor together with a glass of red wine. It's actually much nicer. So the Australians knew this long ago, uh, and they have this funny supermarket chain <laughs> called IGA. So if you do all that, we come back to the STOP IGA trial. This is what we did and what we found. At the start of this six-month run-in period, and this is only the patients who were ultimately uh, randomized into the trial, Blood pressure wasn't too bad. There was only 30% with overt hypertension, you know, by the old definition, not the crazy American definition. Um, they were not really bad. But look at the end of running. 9% were overtly hypertensive. And below 140 over 90 was 70% here and 91% there. There's old Korean data that 4 millimeters mercury make a major difference on outcome in IgA nephropathy, and that probably applies to all glomerular diseases. A very small drop in blood pressure can really affect outcome. What did we find? We had two primary endpoints. One was going into full clinical remission, that is absence of proteinuria and GFR stable, and that was five times more common in the patients who received immunosuppression. So yes, you can induce remission of IgA nephropathy with corticosteroid therapy. It mostly occurred in those who had relatively well-preserved renal function. But the more relevant endpoint was this. Number two, losing more than 15 mils of GFR, and you can see that there was absolutely no effect. Once you have optimized your supportive care to the point that we have optimized it, immunosuppression doesn't do anything anymore. And look at the difference. This is what I just showed you in terms of the Italian trial. This is what we found. Minus 1.2, uh, minus 1.5 in both arms. What we did find, and immunosuppression worked, we had an excess in infectious events. We had one death, pneumogenic sepsis. So it clearly worked. Here's the trial that was meant to be the ultimate final answer to whether steroids make sense in IgA nephropathy, the testing trial. It was meant to be a worldwide trial, so you find all kinds of Europeans on there. Um, but we ended up only doing this in China. It was started with a six-month course of oral methylprednisolone, so quite intense steroids, or, or placebo, and then follow-up. The trial was stopped after two years. It was stopped because we had an infectious, serious, adverse event excess in the steroid group. There were several deaths from pneumocystis infection, 
So clearly the methylprednisolone killed patients. It did work in the way that uh, if you look at the GFR course in the steroid arm, it was somewhat slower the loss than in the placebo arm. Here you have an artifact related to muscle loss uh, during the intense steroid therapy uh, where they probably lowered their creatinine production due to muscle loss. But if you look at this, it did preserve renal function, but it killed patients. <coughs> so the major difference between testing and our study is that this was China, ours was Caucasian, and look at the proteinuria, it was 2.4 at baseline, 1.7 in our patients. And the annual loss of GFR in the supportive group was just like in Italy, minus 6, minus 1.6 in hours. So the concern, once again, is that supportive care wasn't used to the extent that it was used, that you should have used it. There may still be a role for corticosteroids in patients with high-level proteinuria, this is retrospective data where patients with more than 3 grams of proteinuria really responded. This is RAS blocker plus steroid. This is RAS blocker alone. And you can see this is the group where you saw the largest benefit. So in my little world, um, we've talked about the middle segment here. Proteinuria gram or more, GFR often reduced, hypertension, optimized supportive therapy for three to six months, and then stratify by GFR. If your GFR is well preserved and you still have significant proteinuria, the guidelines tell you to use six months of corticosteroid. I've become more and more hesitant in doing so. Maybe highly proteinuric patients have still an indication for this. Maybe there's an indication for this drug, Neficon, the encapsulated budesonide, but that we will only know in, I guess, three to four years. What about adding immunosuppression? Here's a trial from Italy, steroids plus azathioprine <coughs> versus steroids, no difference at all. And this is what I remarked earlier. How many autoimmune diseases do you know where you can get away with steroids only and giving something else in addition to steroid doesn't do better. This doesn't work in membranous, this doesn't work in lupus. They only had more side effects. Hinoch Schönlein purpura, where usually in adults you don't see the full blown picture with arthralgias and uh, abdominal pain, but most of the patients I see have purpura and IgA nephropathy. Here's a French trial, adding steroids plus, I'm sorry for the typo, uh, cyclophosphamide. And you can once again see in terms of GFR outcome, no difference at all. How many autoimmune diseases do you know where adding cyclophosphamide is not better? It certainly isn't in IgA nephropathy and Hinoxone and purpura. Rituximab, no effect at all on proteinuria. This trial was stopped after 34 patients. And the interesting thing is that rituximab didn't eliminate it, the B cells that produce undergalactosylated IgA. The levels were unchanged. So these are funny B cells. MMF, there's a funny situation here. MMF doesn't work in Belgium doesn't work in America, but does work in China. And, and this is Sidney Tang, he's in Hong Kong. Here's another Chinese study by somebody, and I couldn't read it because it's in Chinese. This is why all the question marks are there, but I could read the conclusion. So for some reason it seems that in these mega trials of 20 patients, MMF works in China, but not in Caucasians. And that's an interesting observation in itself because look at the gender. In uh, Caucasians, it's a male disease. In China, it isn't. It's a female disease, if at all. And the other explanation may be that two grams of MMF for a typical Chinese person is different than for a typical Belgian person. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But the implication is that if 
the people in China find something, you need to reproduce it in other <coughs> ethnicities. This is the latest from China, from Nanjing. Prednisolone alone versus MMF plus prednisolone, low-dose prednisolone, no difference. This study is notable for completely insufficient RAS blockade. Uh, almost nobody got a RAS blocker. They got MMF first and steroids first. And I've zoomed out the pathology features here. Um, there are something like 10 different pathology features. And you can see that in both groups, they are literally identical. The last study there that had this perfect harmony, this perfect overlap of many different parameters was the corporate study, which was subsequently <coughs> identified as being made up. I'm a little concerned here that there's such perfect harmony in the baseline features. And finally, blisipimod. Blisipimod is a buff antagonist. It nicely decreases all kinds of immunoglobulin. And the company very happily showed this slide here, protein to creatinine ratio, which <coughs> stayed flat with blisipimod and increased in the placebo group. And they said, yes, it worked. You could also argue, no, it didn't do anything to proteinuria. There's something fishy with the placebo group. It's very unusual in all the trials for the placebo group to almost double their proteinuria in the course <laughs> of a clinical trial. Very unusual. So I'm not convinced this uh, had an effect. So immunosuppression, I hope I've convinced you, has become more and more questionable. Step number three, you deposit immune complexes. Companies are trying to remove that. I think it won't work. Step number four, you engage IgA receptors and activate complement. And this is where, again, it becomes interesting. There are now antibodies to MASP2, and there's a phase three trial just starting. MASP2 is the key enzyme of the lectin pathway, the mannose binding lectin pathway. And, and it's an amazing situation where this American company got the go-ahead from the FDA based on four patients, four IgA nephropathy patients. But they are doing a trial now, um, and maybe we'll eventually see when ecolizumab will ever have competitors and may become cheaper, maybe we see more in this direction. That's certainly an interesting thing. <laughs> I will not go into the bottom here, which is equally relevant, because many times when patients first show up in my office, they have IgA nephropathy, they have proteinuria, but their GFR is already 40. And they ask me, what can I do now? And this is where this bottom part really will become important. And one day, hopefully, we may see non-specific broad spectrum antifibrotic agents in renal disease, just like they have now in lung disease. So that was it from me. Thanks for listening all. <laughs>